All right, Two Cities Church, can I just share with you personally for a minute from my heart about something, and it's going to be about our student ministry. Now, why is student ministry special to me and personal to me? You might say because, well, Kyle, you came to Christ through a student ministry way back in 2001, and that would be true, and that's a huge reason why I love student ministry. But right now, why do I love our student ministry so much? It's not just because I'm a pastor over the student ministry, but believe it or not, I'm a parent in the student ministry. I've got a rising seventh grader, and I can't tell you how much Addie loves our student ministry. Whether it's, Dad, please drop me off early. Dad, please pick me up late, okay? Uh, whether, it, whether it's the young ladies who are investing in her and the other rising seventh graders, whether it's all the friends she's making or the great families we're meeting, and, and I tell you this because I just want to talk for a minute to mom and dad. Can I just talk to mom and dad? Okay, you guys, you can listen in, but just mom and dad, just for one minute, okay? I, I want you to have this great benefit and blessing that, that I have, um, that, me, that, that dozens and dozens of people in our church have. And it's the benefit and blessing of our student ministry. So here's what we say here. We partner with parents to raise a generation in Christ. And we always say this, and we mean this. We can't replace you, but we do want to resource you. Like, we can't replace you. We don't want to replace you. We don't have the time to replace you. And, and here's the amazing thing. If you're a parent, you get to have the best relationship with your kid, a better relationship with your kid than you can have with anyone else on earth because that's what they want. And more than that, you get to be the main spiritual influence in your kid's life. So we're not here to replace you. We want to resource you. So I just want you to know about our student ministry. If for some reason you moved here this summer or you've been coming around and you don't know about it, I'm going to show you a couple pictures. Uh, yeah, we, we went on mission trips to Mississippi and to Virginia Beach. We had a massive conference slash camp, crossroads camp, incredible. People inviting their friends who are far from God, close to them. People coming to Christ at this camp. But I want to talk to you about what we're doing this fall. So starting August 21st, we're relaunching for the fall our student ministry. And if I could just talk to middle schoolers and high schoolers just for a minute, okay? I just want to... I challenge you, middle schooler and high schooler, I double dog dare you, okay, to go to our student ministry four weeks in a row and just check it out and try it out. And you're never too young. If you're in sixth grade, get over here, right? You're never too old. If you're a junior or senior, we want you to end well your last two years with us. And here's why. There's two things you need if you're, well, you always need these, but especially maybe in middle school and high school. You need friends who share your faith, okay? Maybe you have them, okay? But if you don't have them, one of the easiest and most obvious places to get them would be in our student ministry. And the other thing that you need is you need an adult in your life who isn't your parents, as much as we love our parents, who has the same vision and values of our parents, but is another person to talk to. And, and uh, by the way, we just need to, can we have a round of applause for our student leaders? And in in that, I don't remember, you know, we got like, we have like 60 or 70 student leaders. Here's what that means if you don't know what that means. That means they go to community group on a different night of the week than, uh, than Wednesday night so that they can also be available every Wednesday night to invest in your kids. So let's thank God for them. And then we got a lot to cover in our second to last week in 2 Corinthians. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for mom and dad. Just give them wisdom. Give them conviction um, in whatever area they need to lead their kids in. I pray for middle schoolers and high schoolers that they would see but there's a lot of great things you can do in high school. But, but the greatest thing you can do is walk with God in community. And uh, we know that student ministry isn't the only way, but it's one of the main ways. It's certainly one of the main ways at our church. We partner with parents to raise a generation in Christ. Lord, we pray for the student ministry, a great blessing on it, as they have so many dreams and plans for the fall. We particularly pray for this fall retreat on September 13th through 15th. It's just a key and catalytic event that catapults them into the fall. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, Americans are, well, maybe probably everybody is, fascinated with near-death experiences, right? You know what a near-death experience is. It's where you basically clinically or you medically die. Maybe you were in a coma or something like that, and you say you go somewhere else and you see something else, right? This can happen if you drowned and you're resuscitated. This can happen if you're in a massive car accident. And, and people tell similar stories, but different stories about the afterlife and kind of going away from their body and coming back. Usually it, it involves leaving your body, seeing your body. Usually it involves a tunnel and a light. Sometimes it involves seeing loved ones. These, these stories are so popular that when people have these near-death experiences, they write books about them. 
Okay, last two weeks I told you books I want you to read. I'm going to show you some books I don't want you to read. Here we go. Okay, here they are. Uh, have you ever heard of this book? 90 Minutes in Heaven by Don Piper. Not John Piper, okay? <laughs> Different Piper. Uh, whether or not, I don't know this guy's whole story, but, but he gets in a car accident. He says he goes to heaven for 90 mi minutes. He writes a book. It ends up being on the New York Times bestseller list for five years. Why do I tell you that? It's popular. This is, people want to know, what is there? What is the afterlife? What's heaven like? What's death like? All that. Well, there's another guy, and he didn't write 90 minutes in heaven. He wrote 23 minutes in hell. Look at this book, okay? So he didn't get the same journey, okay? He, he, he basically says after this happens, God gives him a vision. He wakes up sweating, screaming in horror on his floor. He writes the book, 23 minutes in hell. You probably heard of this book, the most popular, Heaven is for Real. Young kid goes to heaven, comes back says he met his sister. It's an interesting story. It, it actually was the number one book on the New York Times bestseller list, believe it or not. And it became a major motion picture. Maybe you've seen it. And then there's this book, The Boy Who Went to Heaven and Came Back. The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. Now, this is a sad story because this boy is six years old, gets in a massive car accident, ends up being paralyzed. He and his dad are in this accident. And uh, together, they write a book about how he went to heaven when he temporarily you know, died and came back. And the only problem is, years later, when the boy grew up, he said he lied about the whole thing. Yikes. Why am I talking about this? Because if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about, you maybe never thought about it this way, Paul talks about a near-death experience. Paul goes, guys, hold on, I'm going to tell you about this crazy near-death experience where I'm out of the body, where I'm in the body, I don't really know. Oh, this will make more sense in a second, but, but Paul in chapter 12 says this. <laughs> I must go on boasting. I'm in verse one. Paul basically goes, I hate to brag and boast, but I'm doing it for three chapters. You put me up to it, okay? He says this, though there is nothing to be gained by it, it's God's plan B or C. This is not God's plan A for me to boast. He says, here it is. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. And then he says this, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know. God knows. So he's like, guys, I've got to tell you about this near-death experience. And basically he says, I don't really like to talk about dreams and revelations. By the way, we need to just at, talk, ask this question for a second. What are the roles of dreams and revelations and visions in Christianity or in Christians' lives today? And I like anything else, Christians debate and dialogue and discuss these issues. On one side, there are the people who go, no dreams, no visions, no special revelations, we have the Bible, the canon is closed, that was then, this is now. If you have a dream, go back to sleep when you wake up. I mean, that's what they would say. Don't think anything else of it. On the other side, right, are, are the people that say, okay, no, no, I, I read the book of Joel. Joel. And it says in the final days, the young men will dream dreams. And we got a dream and God is still speaking and the spirit is still moving and how do we think of it here? Well, we think of it as Scripture is the highest authority. And all other types of dreams that someone might have, need, it's secondary, it's supplemental, it's submitted to Scripture. We're not saying it can't happen, but you're never going to have a dream that's going to say the opposite of what the Bible says. You're never going to wake up and go, I just had a dream. God told me to leave my wife and kids. It's like, you dialed the wrong number. Go back to sleep, <laughs> right? Okay. <clears throat> Paul had many unique dreams. I, I can't go through them all. In, in, uh, in Acts 9... Paul gets a vision of Christ on the road to Damascus, maybe the most famous vision. In Acts 16, Paul goes to sleep, it says, and while he was sleeping one night, he gets a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come, the Macedonian call. In Acts 18, Paul's discouraged because he's been suffering a lot, and God appears to him by an angel in the night and says, keep preaching the gospel, I have many people in the city. In Acts 27, the very book, end of the book of Acts, the, the ship is about to get shipwrecked for Paul's fourth time, and God says, don't worry, no one's going to get hurt. I've got to protect you because you're going to go to Rome and preach the gospel to Caesar. So he gets all these different visions. But this is the most intense and most immersive. Let's look at how he describes it. <clears throat> look here. He says this, I know a man in Christ. Now, why is he not? Why, Paul, why are you talking in the third person? This was a, a rabbinical way to be humble, have a humble posture when you're talking about good things you have done. Okay? So he says this. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up. Literally, the word is raptured in the Greek. Caught up to the third heaven. How many heavens are there? We'll talk about that. Now, look at this. This is a classic near-death experience. Well, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. 
Okay, let's talk about when this happened, 14 years ago. So if you, I won't bore you with all details, if you find out when Paul writes 2 Corinthians and you back up 14 years, you get to Paul's time in Troas. Well, what happened in Troas? Well, it was the only time Paul was stoned. Most people think here's what happened. Paul was stoned and then he had a vision. Some of you go, same thing happened to me in college. That was different. <laughs> that, was, that was a different stoning. That was a different vision. What I mean by this is he had rocks pelted at him. And he was, they, they said, if you read the account, they said that he was left for dead. They thought he was dead. And then he gets back up later. And many people, and it makes sense for other reasons I'll show you later, many people think that during this time, Paul has this near-death experience where he is caught up into the third heaven. Look, look, he calls it one other thing. Verse three, and, and I know that this man was caught up, same word, raptured, into paradise. That's interesting. That literally means a walled garden. It's like a picture of being back in Eden, but with no snakes. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. So Paul's repeating himself. God knows. So basically, I don't know what happened. It was kind of crazy. Um, okay, what is the third heaven? Well, it's also paradise. Let's talk about heaven. So there are three heavens in the Bible. Okay, the, the first heaven, you, you, you hear about when the statements in the Bible that goes, the birds of the heaven. That's the sky in the day, okay? The first heavens, you can, they're called the uh, atmospheric heavens. You can get in an airplane, and incredible today, and you can get above the clouds, and you can be in the atmospheric heavens. You can be in the first heavens. Then there's the second heavens, and the psalmists talk about the second heavens. They talk about the stars in the heavens. The second heavens are the celestial heavens, and unbelievably, the apostle Paul wouldn't believe it if you had told him. That you could get in a spaceship if you've got enough money, and you can go into the second heavens. By the way, why are all the billionaires building spaceships? Do they know things we don't know? Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, they're all heading into the second heavens. The third heavens is the eternal heavens where the angels are and where God's presence dwells. And you can get to the first heaven in an airplane and you get the second heaven in a spaceship. But the only way to get into the third heaven is to be in Christ. Now, here's what's interesting. So there was, this is a famous story. I can't remember what astronaut it was. There was an astronaut. He was like an atheist. And he goes into the second heavens on a spaceship. I don't know if you heard the story. And he comes back and does like a press conference afterwards. And he goes, guys, I've gone into the heavens. And I looked around and I've come back to tell you God is not there. And someone in the crowd said, if you stepped out of your space suit, you would have seen him. <laughs> Paul says, I was taken into the third heavens. Paul says, I was taken into paradise. But then this is why I started with the near-death experience stories, because it's interesting what Paul says. And he heard things, look, <clears throat> that cannot be told, which may not be uttered. So the reason that people are suspicious of near-death experiences and long stories and, you know, book deals and publishing contracts and movie rights afterwards is Paul basically says, guys, I'm an apostle. I went to heaven. I can't tell you what I saw. It actually says that two different ways, right? May not utter, and then he says at the beginning, that can't be described. So I think this is what he means. I couldn't explain it to you if I tried. It'd be like trying to, you don't have the categories for it. It'd be like trying to explain a sunset to a blind person. You just, good luck, you can't do it. It would be like trying to explain to a six-year-old how much they're going to enjoy their honeymoon. They're not mature enough. They don't even have the categories that would make sense. Paul says, here's, here, here's where we're going with the rest of the time. Paul goes, guys, I, I don't really like to talk about my supernatural spiritual experiences because they're like, they're special. I don't even get a lot of them. And most of you will get none of them, is what Paul's saying. He said, so for the rest of the time, I don't want to talk about my successes, but I want to talk about my struggles. He says, for the rest of the time, I want to talk about something that we can all relate to because we can't all relate to near-death experiences. He said, here's something we can all relate to, weakness. I'll show you. Look what he says in verse 5. This is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. He says this, on behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. So Paul's a strange guy. He's going to boast in his weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it. So here, here's why. 
so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So here's what Paul says. I want you to have, and this is what you should want for people, I want you to have an accurate picture of me. I want you to know my strengths and my weaknesses. I want you to know my blessings and the burdens that are on my life. I want you to have a holistic picture. I want you to know, Paul says, I, I, Paul goes, I want you to know how God has honored me with great visions and revelations and dreams. And I want you to know how God, he's going to show you this in a second, how God has humbled me. So we got to talk about weaknesses. Get ready, okay? This is what we're talking about for the rest of this morning, okay? We're just going to talk about weaknesses. So we have to define what a weakness is, right? A we, what is a weakness? It's like, well, we could use the most basic, like a three-year-old could understand it. It's anywhere where you lack strength, obviously. And they, but they're like, what is it about us that we don't like to talk about our weaknesses? We don't like to share our weaknesses? Well, think about it. If you're at war, what is your goal with the enemy? To find out where they're weak. Why do teams watch film of each other before the game day? I want to know where you're weak. The reason it's scary to say where we're weak is like it could be exploited. This is why even spouses sometimes don't even like to let their spouse know where they're weak. And, and then it's hard, right? Because like nobody wants to be weak. Uh, I mean, think about, and I had to think about this for a while, but what is the point of social media? I mean, there's, and the reason I talk about social media so much is because we're all on it so much. It's just, that's where we live. Social media exists to share strengths. That's why it has a filter. That's why you went on vacation and you found the best picture of you to put online no matter how anyone else in that picture may have looked, okay? This is why we don't, right? Maybe some of you do, but the average person does not, like, put an Instagram picture up. You know, husband and I just fought for three hours. I have a headache. But we put up date night even if we only do it once every six months. It's okay. Just understand that. Social media is about sharing our strengths, and we don't like to talk about our weaknesses, right? Like even when, like, and every job asks for it. Every job asks for it. Every job interview worth its salt. Every job application says something like, what are your weaknesses? And what do you say? I work too hard. I care too much. I put people in front of myself to the detriment of myself. That's what we say. And what we're really saying is, I don't know my weaknesses or I don't want to share them. So you have to know your weaknesses, and some of you don't know your weaknesses, and it's a terrible thing to not know your weaknesses, and the reason for that is very simple, because everybody else around you knows your weaknesses. Your classmates know them, your coworkers know them, your kids know them, your spouse knows them. So what do you do once you realize that you have weaknesses, right? Because it's, we don't even like we don't look up to people with weaknesses naturally. Like, do you want a weak leader? It's like, no, no one wants that. Do you want a weak spouse? It's like, yeah. I mean, why do people date? If you're normal, what attracted you to your now spouse or your current girlfriend or boyfriend was his or her strengths, obviously. How good looking he or she was, how funny, how great their personality, their earning potential, their, their capacity, their competency. So now we got to talk about weaknesses. I want to give you the purpose of weaknesses, okay? And then we're going to look at what Paul says. Because there are many manifold purposes of weaknesses, but I want to give you four of them today that I just encourage you. Because part of what we want to do is we just want to, if we're going to be open Bible, open life here, we got to talk about our weaknesses. Four purposes for weaknesses. I think these are really helpful. Number one, the number one purpose for weaknesses is it makes you more relatable to other people, okay? This is a super big principle, especially if you become you know, successful, and you have, I don't know what that looks like for you, and you have the corner office, and you got more money and more time and more platform, you have to realize this. This is such an important principle. Success separates weaknesses welcome. So success does impress, and that's always fun, okay? And it's fun to be impressed, and it's fun to impress other people and all that, okay? But success impresses, but success by definition separates, okay? But weakness, no matter what it is, will always welcome other people, even if it's a different weakness. Here, I'll show you how this works, Okay? So, you know, it's just a little awkward for me to do, but I'm going to talk about myself just for a second to prove a point, okay? If I talk, not that I have that many, but if I talked about some of my strengths and successes, a lot of which had nothing to do with me, so if I talked to you for a while about growing up in an upper-middle-class home, 
every weekend playing the country club. A lot of you would be like, you jerk. <laughs> I've never played it. What are you talking? Can you even relate to me? If I talked about, you know, some of the exciting joys of leading a large, fast-growing church, it might be interesting, but it would create distance. But if I talk about Margie and our marriage, the first year we were married, and how it was horrible. We had the worst first year of marriage of almost anybody that I know as we tried to put our lives together. It was just it was a really dark, hard time. And then Margie repented, and it was great. We just... <laughs> she knows that joke. Okay, no, no, no. We both needed to repent and grow. But, okay, if I, if I told you that, like, you know, for, like, a, until I was probably in my early 30s, I just felt behind in life. I felt behind in my job. I felt behind financially. I felt behind in my family. I just felt like I was playing catch up. And I didn't, I just, I'd compare myself to where my dad was at that. Anyway, I could go into, it's a long story. If I talked about losing my nearest and dearest friend suddenly, almost a year ago to this day, well, you can just, I just wanted to show you what it feels like in a room. That feels, you will immediately, I, here's what I've noticed. Whenever I share something personal from my life, more people give me hugs after service. <laughs> Every time. Because they just feel closer to me. Success separates. Weakness is welcome. By Second principle, so important. Why did God give us weaknesses? Because it makes you more empathetic toward other people. Here's another principle. Where you are competent, it's hard for you to have compassion, right? Or let's say another way. Where you are strong, it is hard for you to have sympathy. If you've never struggled with anxiety and depression, it is very easy to have this mentality. Maybe you would never say it out loud, but it's easy to have this mentality. Cheer up. Can you please smile? Everybody has problems. Get over it, right? And then one day you have anxiety and depression. You're like, uh, I can't turn happy on on the inside. That's interesting. If you have, ne you know, who knows your stories? I don't know all your stories, obviously. But if you've never struggled financially, that's okay. You know, and you've just, you've just always had enough money to do whatever you want to do. You're just not going to have a ton of compassion on the person who goes, dude, I'm trying really, really hard, and I feel like this is a reasonable budget, and I am struggling all the time. If you hit the genetic lottery, and it's just like, man, there's like no health issues, there's no surgery, there's very little sickness, you, you know, you, you, you're going to struggle to relate to someone's struggle with trying to lose weight or someone's chronic illness. And so often what God does is he gives us weaknesses to make us more compassionate. Third, weaknesses help build relationships. So, you know, I mean, there's a million ways, I guess, you build relationships. But one way to build relationships is, like, just be strong and find someone else who's strong. Like, you're good at this, and I'm good at this, and let's go build a company or a business together. Or you love to do this, and I love to do that. Let's go do this hobby together, and we'll both be great at it together. And, and, and lots of friendships start that way. But I'm just telling you what I've seen in my own community group. And if you want to deepen the relationship in your community group, or you want to deepen the relationship in your DNA group, it normally happens. You can't plan this, but this is just how it happens. Somebody steps up and admits an area where they're weak and they need help. And they're just like, you know what? I'm not really good at this whole marriage thing, and I don't, I don't think I'm like living in overt sin about it, but I just, our marriage isn't great, and I need help. Or you reach out to someone in your group and you go, hey, I don't, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but when I read the Bible, I feel nothing. And I really need help. Or, you, or you, what, they, what the Puritans used to call, maybe you struggle with spiritual depression. That was a phrase the Puritans loved to use. I'm just, I'm just dry. And God feels distant. And could we get together and could you, could you help me pray about these things in my life? Anyway, I'm just telling you, God will often use our weaknesses if we're humble enough to open up about them 
to build deeper relationships. Finally, and then we'll move on, weaknesses help you know where you need to grow. Obviously, that's the most simple, straightforward one. The fourth purpose is your own development. Basically, if you can find, and there's different types of weaknesses, you'll see this in a minute, but if you can discover your weaknesses early in your life, you can decide, is this a weakness? We'll see. There's two types of weaknesses. There's the weakness that can be fixed, and there's a the weakness that can't. There's the weakness you can grow in, and there's a weakness that's never changing. And the earlier you can find that out, the better. Also, because Satan will uniquely tempt you in your strengths, and he will uniquely tempt you in your weaknesses, so you better know what they both are. Now, let's look at what Paul says. He, Paul gives a name to this weakness. I want you to see this. Paul gives a name. So to keep me from being conceited, I'm in verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. So he says, basically, because I get to write the Bible and God speaks to me, he also has humbled me. Here it is. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. I want to talk to you about a thorn. What is a thorn? A thorn, listen, is a weakness that won't go away. It's never going away. It didn't go away. For, it's not going away for, for uh, you either. We'll talk about this. See, the word thorn in the Greek is a word that can either mean steak, not like ribeye steak, but S-T-A-K-E, steak, like a steak that you'd put like a tent in the ground. Paul's using another illustration he's familiar with. He's like, all right, it's like a, <laughs> a tent peg is stuck in my side. That's pretty graphic. That's what he's basically saying. That's one way you can translate the word um, that is thorn. The other way, and I think this is helpful, the other way is a splinter. What is a splinter? Well, it's something small. You ever get a splinter in your finger, especially because it's like, and you feel it all the time. You feel it little by little throughout the day, you feel it. What, here's what I'm trying to say. For some of you, your thorn is a big thing. It's a stake in your side, and you knew it as soon as I started talking about it. For others of you, you if you couldn't think, think about like a glaring weakness in your life, you may have many, many different splinters. Here's the point. What does the splinter and the stake have in common? What is he trying to get at? This is something that sticks in you, lingers, and does not leave. This could be something like same-sex attraction. Where some 12-year-old, or it's always the same way, these stories are in the church, a 12-year-old or 13-year-old boy who's in a church like this, listening to sermons like mine, starts to feel like, well, this is weird. Everybody else is talking about the pretty girls and I'm thinking about the guys. And then he starts to pray about that. And, and all the prayers are pretty similar. They're all the same prayer you'd pray if you struggle with that, which would be something like this, Lord, uh, I don't want these feelings. And take it away. And tomorrow when I wake up, I'd like to not feel this way again. And I know people in our church that started to feel that at 13. And now they're married with kids, married to a woman, and still feel some of that at 33. Sometimes it, it could be something as small in your life as a couple allergies that you have that have just hindered you. It could be a chronic illness. It could be something like type 1 diabetes. It could be that you're not as, it could be dyslexia. We'll see this. God's going to have a purpose for all of this. What is Paul's thorn? Well, I, we don't know for sure. Okay? Let me give you what some people say. Some people say, I'll just give you the main ones. They say, uh, Paul's reputation was a thorn in his side the rest of his life. Because he lived such a, you know, he was such a persecutor of the church and he, you know, had Christians killed. And even though God had done a great work in his life, he could never get over his past, okay? And some of you may have an experience like that. It's like a thorn in your side, something you did in the past that others bring up. Other people say, no, it was, it was these Judaizers and these, the, these false teachers that he's, they're a thorn in his side. It was a relational thing. They, they always show up. And they always, basically everywhere go, Paul goes, he builds something and people come behind him and break it down. He's like, it's like a, ah, that's how he feels. A lot of people think, and it probably most likely was a physical illness or issue. 
Some say epilepsy. I don't know where they get that from, but that's been commonly said. Others say migraines. What we think it is, and, and I'll tell you why, we think Paul had an eye problem. Think back to what I told you. When does he get the vision that he also says God decides to humble him after the vision? Well, if our timeline is right and he gets the vision when he is pelted with rocks, imagine you're pelted with rocks and a couple of them hit you in the face. Most people think Paul had eye problems. Why? Because after Troas, Paul goes to Galatia and he writes in the letter to the Galatians, you can go read it. He goes, guys, I visited you and you were willing to give me your very eyes. Now that's a weird, that's not something that was like, not like a colloquial saying, like that's weird. And then Paul signs the end of the book of Galatians, look with what large letters I write. Well, why would you write with large letters? Only if you couldn't see very well. In fact, if a lot of Paul's letters, Paul didn't write, he dictated, including Romans, to somebody else who signs at the end. Think about how hard your job would be. This is, this is going to be helpful as we think about thorns in a little bit. But think about how hard Paul traveled for a living and wrote letters and really what we think struggled to see. You ever wonder, why was Paul shipwrecked three or four times? Maybe he was driving the ship. I don't know. Okay. What's the purpose of the thorn? Let's go back to verse 7. What's the purpose of a thorn? Because that's the, that is most likely the question you'll ask, and I'll ask. To keep me from becoming conceited. Now watch, that's going to be mentioned twice. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. So he starts and ends with to not be conceited. But in the middle, he calls it a messenger of Satan. Okay, this is where you have to put your thinking cap on and you have to go, when the Bible says two different things that seem to contradict themselves, I believe them both at the same time, okay? And here's what Paul says. Do you want to know where the thorn's from? His answer is God and Satan. It, do you want to know what's going on with the, the weakness that you're dealing with? God has a plan for it and Satan has a plan for it. There's two different actors. There's two different agents. They have two different goals. They have two different motives. They have two different strategies. That's what I'm saying. Let's start with Satan. It says the purpose of the thorn in your flesh from Satan is to harass you. In the Greek, it means to punch you with a clenched fist. That's what it means. Uh, basically, think about this. What God wants, or what Satan, I'm sorry, what Satan wants you to do is focus on your weaknesses, to be discouraged by your weaknesses, to be defeated by your weaknesses, to be depressed by your weaknesses, to think God can't, God can't use me because look at my marriage. God can't use me because look at my past. God can't use me because look at my education. I mean, that's what Satan wants. It says God has a, another purpose, and it says his purpose, if you see that, is to humble us and make us dependent on him. Now, I know we don't like to admit this, but we're all prone to pride. And I guess God in his wisdom has decided that one of the ways he's going to keep us humble, I don't know how else to interpret this text, than to give us life long weaknesses that make us trust and depend on him. So what do you do with the thorn? Here, I'll see. Let me show you what Paul did with the thorn. Tur turn with me to verse 8. <laughs> Three times I pleaded. That means I desperately prayed about this. With the Lord about this, look, that it should leave me. So here's a real practical, if you take notes, here's the most practical thing. If you have a thorn, pray for God to take it away. That's like the first thing. Paul's like, I, I, there was this pain, and there was this pressure, and there was this problems in my life, and, and, and let's just say that we're right on what it is. I can't see. Can you please take that away so I can see? And he probably had all these reasons. Because God, then, then I'll get places more quickly, and God, then I'll write more letters, or whatever it is. Here, here's, here's the thing. I don't think, when you read that, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take away, okay? I don't think this is what he means. If you know the Apostle Paul, right, you know this is what he means. Paul does not mean he got up on Monday morning and he prayed about it one time. And then he got up on Tuesday morning and he said, well, I prayed about this yesterday. Let's pray about it a second time. And he prayed about it a second time. And then get up on Wednesday morning and go, the last few days, let me pray about it one more time and then I'm done. That's not what Paul means. Here's what Paul most likely means, I think. Paul means, and this will, you'll know this if you've ever had a weakness in your life, Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord three times. Here's what this means. There were three different seasons of my life I asked God to do something about this. 
Here's how we might say it today. Yeah, when I was single, you know, I remember praying about this, this disability. that I, I remember praying about a disability I had, and I remember my roommate and I praying about it and asking God, can, can you change this while I'm young? And then there was another season when I got married and, we had a, and I had that same disability. And I, my wife and I, or my husband and I, we, we prayed about it. And then when we had kids, I thought, I don't want this with kids. So we, we got on our knees, especially when our second one was born, and, and we asked God to, to take it away. Now, okay, this is the most, you know, I want to be sensitive with this, but this is the most, like, important thing to understand. If you look, and we'll get there in a second, we're going to see the answer that Paul gets to asking God to take away a thorn in his flesh. And you know the answer. The answer is no. Which is really hard for me. I mean, as a pastor, I hate, I hate you know, seeing people be heartbroken over all of the unanswered prayer in their lives. Now, granted, a lot of times you pray for something and God says, Go, you got it. We're good. And sometimes you pray for something and God says, slow, slow, hold on. You're going to get it, but not eventually. And sometimes God says, no. Like, here's what this means sometimes God says, I'm not fixing that. Yikes. Sometimes God says, I'm not changing that. Here's what this means. Like, as proud of this, I can make it. Sometimes you say, God, will you heal me? And God says, I'm not healing that. Yikes. And you say, God, I want to get pregnant. And God says, no. And God, I want to get married. No. God, please take away all the crazy idiosyncrasies of my spouse. No. But seriously, this is very hard on us because <laughs> we struggle let me say it this way. It's hard for us to accept that hard things come from God and that he allows them in our life for a greater purpose and he's not planning on taking them away your entire life. It's like, wow. Oh, let me show you what he says instead. I'm just showing you right in the text. Here's what it says. But he said to me, look here. <clears throat> this is the famous verse. My grace, I love that. God says grace belongs to me. What is grace? Grace. Grace is God doing for you what you can't do for yourself. My grace is sufficient for you. Here it is, look. For my power, so he associates my power and my grace. So God's grace is his power in, in your life. Is made perfect in weakness. Okay, I'm going to try to explain this. Every once in a while, God says to somebody, I'm not taking something away. I'm going to add something to it. I'm not, take, I'm not going to give you, let me say it this way, I'm not going to give you relief. I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you a supernatural power to do what the Bible says, which is to finish well, to endure, and to persevere. Or And here's... Here's another really interesting thing just to think about that I'll try to explain. Paul shows us something else that's interesting about God. God does not give us explanations for the thorn, but promises for the thorn. So we don't get an explanation. We get a promise. And if you've ever had a thorn that's really bad, what you want is an explanation. You're like, why did I get type one, di type 1 diabetes when I was 20? You want to know that? Why was I in that car accident that left me limping? Why did I get chronic pain in my 50s? You're like, I, I, you're like God, I need an explanation. If you give me an explanation, God's like, I'm not giving you an explanation. And then normally you need to know, like there's two things you want to know. Why did this happen and how are you going to use it? So then you want that, like, and that's understandable. It's like, okay, God. I get it. I got the thorn. I got the weakness, whatever it's going to be. God, just can you just tell me how you're going to use it? And at least with the Apostle Paul, who if anybody we'd say, God would take it away or God would explain it to him, God says, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. I'm not going to be able to give you the explanation right now, but I'm going to give you promises, which seems to work for Paul. Hopefully it can work for us. Here's what Paul says. 
Therefore, Paul's like, I got it. <laughs> Might have taken him a while, but he goes, therefore, and then again, look, look at this. Paul's crazy. I will boast all the more gladly. So he said earlier, I'll boast my weaknesses. Now he says, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. I mean, could you imagine the Apostle Paul? He shows up, guys, I can't see. It's awesome. You know, that's, I mean, it's, it's something like that. He says, why? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm, con I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. And then this phrase, we, we say this, and it looks great on a bumper sticker, and it looks great hanging on your wall, but we're not sure what it means. In fact, a lot of people think it says, for when I am weak, then he is strong. It doesn't say that. It says, when I'm weak, I'm strong. How does, that sounds like an oxymoron. We'll try to unpack it toward the end here, but I want you to see something. <clears throat> There's two steps to dealing with your weaknesses. Well, let's just call it three. The first is admitting that you have them. You know, it's okay. We all have them. Everybody has a thorn. The reason that we don't know what Paul's thorn is, thorn is, is because God's saying, fill in the blank. We all have them. But the second thing is you, you can hopefully communicate about your weaknesses. So Paul, Paul moves from admitting he has weaknesses to communicating them. Guys, this is... And then, in some way, Paul's able to get to the place of celebrating his weaknesses. And again, I know it's a broad category I'm giving you for weaknesses. But here's what I want us to think about. This is, this is not a word for everyone today, but I think it's probably a word for all of us eventually. I want, just think about this with me for a second, okay? You wrestle with the Lord. You wrestle with Scripture over this. Paul says, I prayed about this three times. And then I said, therefore, I will boast of my weaknesses. In other words, Paul said, I stopped praying about this. This is what this, okay, Paul has a, let me give you the broader category, submission to the will of God for our lives. Paul says, for some of us, and I can't tell you, I, I'm not going to play JV Holy Spirit and tell you, but every once in a while, you got to go, God, I'm done asking, and I'm going to start accepting. And that's really, okay, let me just tell you a story from our church. Okay, I'm not saying I'm not speaking this over every woman in our church, but we had this, we had this lady in our church, and this was a while ago, and she came up to me and she told me, "Hey, Pastor Kyle, my husband and I, we have longed to get have kids of our own for years, and we've tried everything and everything and everything, and it's been a decade, and we just realized God was saying no to our prayer and our desire to be kid to have our own kids, and but God has really put on our heart since we've accepted that." the call to foster care and adoption. I, you know, it's like, whoa, okay. So you saw God say no. This is how she interpreted it. And point her in a different direction because there was a different purpose. What I'm trying to tell you is every once in a while in your life, you need to go, okay, it's time to move forward. At least say for this next season of my life. I am going to accept what God has for me. Because here's what I think Paul means when he says, what does Paul mean? Let me give you my best understanding of what Paul means when he says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Here's what he means. This is an, there's an element of faith with this. I am, here's what he means. I am more effective with my thorn than without it. Which is the exact opposite of how we think, Right? Here's what we tend to think. God, if my marriage wasn't so dysfunctional, God, if I didn't have this learning disability, God, if I didn't have this chronic pain, if I didn't have this difficult relationship, then, then, then I'd be just take it away because then I would be more effective. It makes me think of, strangely, but this will make sense in a second. It makes me think of chess. Anyone in here like chess? I like chess so much better than checkers because it's so sophisticated. But the first time you teach someone to play chess, it's so confusing, right? The pawn can only move one, except if it's your first move. But then you have to, some of you won't even understand this, but some of you have to take it diagonally, and, and then you show them all these different people. This is what the bishop does, and this is what the rook does, and this is what the queen, and everyone's like, what? And here's the whole point. 
The game cannot be played until you accept the limits of what each piece can do. As soon as you're like, that's what it can do. Then all of a sudden, the well, you get unbelievably creative with that piece. And you see how valuable that piece is versus another piece on the board. I'm asking you today to accept your limits. I'm not saying stop asking. I'm saying the first thing we see Paul do is ask, but we see Paul get to the place of accepting. Now, we talked about weaknesses the whole time today, for the most part, and uh, we talked about all the different weaknesses that we have, but I want, I want to show us as we close one weakness we all have together. In Romans 5, verse 26, here's what it says. Romans 5, 26, Paul says this, for speaking to the entire human race, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So Paul says there's a type of weakness that I want you to know about. It's a spiritual inability to work your way to God. And here's what he says, that while we were still weak and ungodly, Christ died for us. Think about this. What is the story of Christ? The story of Christ is somebody very powerful becoming very weak. When you look at the cross of Christ, what you see is weakness, but what is manifested, if you can see it, in the weakness is the power of God to save. The way Jesus saved us was by becoming weak for us. And we're not only told one place about Jesus and weakness. In Hebrews 4, 15, it says this, For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. I love that. Here's what he says. He says, all right, <laughs> Jesus understands he was fully God, fully man. He was tempted in every way. He understands your weaknesses. Because I know some of you out here today might be like, Kyle, I don't know. You didn't mention my category. It's like, well, I can't mention them all, but Jesus knows them all. He's experienced them. And the Bible says that when you have a weakness, you can take it to Jesus. In fact, if I could translate that passage, it says, take your thorn to the throne of grace and ask God to do something. And, and, and here's the honest truth. When we talk about thorns and all the different things that you guys are all dealing with and I'm dealing with, it makes me think of one final verse. It says this, likewise, the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we're gonna, we're gonna end praying together right now. And here's the truth, when it comes to weaknesses, there's always that tension that I tried to explain today. And here's the tension. Here's the tension when it comes to weaknesses. Do I pray and ask God to take it away? Or is it time to pray and say, God, help me accept this? Is it time for me to say, please remove this? Or is it time for me to say, God, help me to move forward in this? And so here's what I want to do. If, if, if today, and I'm not going to ask anyone to share their weaknesses, don't worry. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you would say, you know what? There's a thorn in my flesh. Or maybe there's a thorn in the flesh of somebody I love, Lord, and because and, it hurts to see my kids hurt. And I want, I'm going to stand, and I'm going to pray, and I want you to pray, and this is what I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God takes away the thorn. Not that I've got it. We're just going to pray together. God take away the thorn. But then there's, a, there's another group of you, and we're not going to know the difference. So you're all going to stand together. There's another group of you that you're going to stand, and it's because you've been asking. And you've been asking, and you've been asking, and you've been asking. And maybe the prayer you're going to say is, Lord, help me to accept this. Help me to accept these limits and help me to move forward and watch you move. So if, if you're in either one of those categories, just stand up all over the room right now. Just stand up. There's no shame. Thank you, guys. Yes. We're just going to, yes, we're going to pray together, guys. As you guys close your, close your eyes and let's pray for these, these people all over our church. Lord, we're just, we're a weak church. Lord, we're weak. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, not many were called who are strong. So it's not a surprise that we'd all be standing in here, Lord. Lord, I, want, I pray for the power of Christ to rest upon the weak right now. Lord, I ask for anyone in here who's got some kind of, whether it's a splinter or a stake in their side, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would remove the thorn for their good, the good of their families, the good of our city, for your glory, Lord, so that they can do so much more ministry, mission, and mercy and be set free. Lord, and so there's just people that I pray that all over here, Lord, you just be taking thorns out right now. Thorns that they've had for, for decades. Lord, but at the same time, Lord, there's, there's, I don't know if it's a, a lot of these people or a few of these people that they just have felt today and, and only the Holy Spirit can speak into a person's heart. It, it's time. It's time to submit. 
It's time to say, this is my life. This is my family. This is my health. And it's time to stop looking for a loophole and start looking for grace. Lord, and I pray that there, there will be so much grace, and whether you take it away or you meet them powerfully in it. We ask all this in Jesus' name. The rest of you may stand.